Good afternoon. I want to speak to you today in a series of philosophers, saints, and poets I have known about a man, Mahatma Gandhi. At no time in the history of mankind has one man, during his lifetime, had so many followers, so many admirers, so many people who would have gladly given their life for him than this one little thin, dark man known to the world as Mahatma Gandhi. I said that at no time in our history had one man influenced the life of so many millions of people during his own lifetime, during his own sojourn in this world, while he walked and labored and taught among them. And this half-naked little Hindu, Mahandas Karamchat Gandhi, whose epitaph or honorific title, Mahatma, meaning in Hindustani, great soul, was given to him by the people as a title of the highest reverence and adoration and love. Let us make this quite clear, even at the risk of being too punctilious. We are not speaking here of the scourges of mankind, of the tyrants, dictators, kings and rulers, who while they were followed by the multitudes, while those people were seemingly willing to do their bidding, many of them, nevertheless, hated and feared and cursed their leaders. Turn the pages of history and look at those men from Alexander the Great and Caesar, Nero, Genghis Khan and Attila, from the pharaohs of old in the book of Nasser, Hannibal to Charlemagne in Barbarossa, from Napoleon down to the dictators of our own day, whose names will remain a black curse in the memory of men. Though even these last scourges of mankind, who have brought so much misery and destruction to so many countless millions, even they, as far as lasting influence is concerned, cannot be considered here at all. Uh, but let us, when we want to understand the Mahatma, Think of those other great souls who founded the six great religions of mankind. Let us rather think of Moses, Jesus, Buddha, Confucius, Zoroaster, and Muhammad. During their lifetime, of course, all these men influenced comparatively few people, though they have later in the course of time penetrated into the hearts and minds of over 200 generations of the races of mankind. Now Gandhi did not found a new religion. He was not a god, neither was he a prophet in the sense that Muhammad used this title for himself, but he was a true prophet in the sense that he understood some of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. A man who combined the love for peace of a Jeremiah with a zeal for social justice, equality and freedom of the prophets of sublime vision like Micah, and, and Isaiah, and Jesus. And yet, he was deified during his life. In our own day, and by countless millions, and he was considered a godlike man. In short, he was a saint, and proclaimed as a saint not only in India, but Gandhi refused to accept the title of saint. It grieved him deeply when he saw that he was being worshipped as a superhuman being. Gandhi disliked even to be called Mahatma, great soul. And his friends and close disciples called him simply Bapu or Bapuchi, meaning father. And very often he was formally addressed as Gandhiji. And the suffix G is an endearing and at the same time, a reverent form of addressing a distinguished person in India. It does, for instance, Nehru, you know, the present Prime Minister, is commonly referred to in India as Nehruji. Uh, I remember that during my stay in India, it happened that Gandhi's image was put up in one of the Hindu temples in Bengal, and the simple worshippers used to pray and sing the Vedas to his image and adorned it with garlands of flowers. It was widely reported in the Indian press. Now, when Gandhi heard about it, he wrote to Bengal in a severe tone, admonishing them and uh, 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 all those followers for their folly and forbidding them 
such idolatry and deification. I am not a saint, declared on several occasions. I am an ordinary human being. What I have done, anybody can do. The only virtue I want to claim is truth and non-violence. I lay no claim to superhuman powers, and I want none. I wear the same corrupt flesh as the weakest of my fellow beings wear, and am therefore as liable to err as any. My services have many limitations, but God has up to now blessed them in spite of the imperfections, for confession of error is like a broom that sweeps away dirt and leaves the surface cleaner than before. Yes, I feel stronger for my confession, and the cause must prosper for the retracing. Never has man reached his destination by deviations from the straight path. Yes, I do not know of any other man in the history of the world who swayed the hearts and minds of so many of his contemporaries, who have so openly and frankly declared their simple humanity and human error. Mahatma Gandhi, the man who was destined to change the life of 400 million peoples of India and most of Asia, was born in 1869 in a little place called Parbandar in the province of Katyavar of a Banya family, a middle-class merchant family, but rather impoverished. I should like to remind my listeners here that the Banya caste in India is one of the lower classes. At the age of 19, he went to London and he studied law at a time, uh, for a time at the university college, and he was called to bar by the inner temple. He was so proud of his European clothes then, rather curious, that there are photographs that he had taken of himself wearing nonchalantly a silk top hat and a Victorian frock coat with winged collars and a bow tie. Uh, just imagine Gandhi in such an attire. There is even a legend going around that so eager was Gandhi to break into the European society, particularly British society, with all its ensnaring promises, that he took even dancing lessons in London and, and broke many of the Hindu religious laws by eating beef and other ritual violations, which he himself admits in his wonderful autobiography. After returning as a young lawyer to the Bombay High Court, he was called by a well-known business firm to go to South Africa, where he threw himself at once into a long and fierce struggle for the liberties of the Indian settlers in that country. He admits that he was not a very good lawyer, although a very prosperous one. He refused a great number of cases which would, would have been easy for him to win, but of whose morality and ethics he was not absolutely convinced. Uh, very soon, he gave up his lucrative practice altogether, relinquishing his large income as an advocate, and founded a colony with the help of his Jewish friends in Johannesburg for his compatriots on Tolstoyan lines near Durban. As the price, he paid for his championship of the Indian grievances. Besides being more than once arrested and thrown into jail, he refused frequently being insulted and injured at the hands of his opponents. This neither checked his energies nor deterred him from rendering service of marked loyalty to the government on three occasions for he raised and commanded a Red Cross unit in the Boer War. He organized a plague hospital when the epidemic brought out, uh, broke out in Johannesburg. And he led a stretcher bearer party in the uh, suppression of the Natal revolt in 1908. But his labors were not in vain. At last, in 1914, a commission of inquiry into the Indian discontent recommended the removal of several of the worst injustices against which Gandhi had striven and he felt justified in leaving South Africa and returning home to India. There, a wider field of political protest awaited him, and he was soon at work organizing the Indian Congress and challenged the British Empire, not with an army or with guns, but with a sole force and non-cooperation. But let it be remembered here, 
that some of Gandhi's greatest supporters in the struggle against the British Empire were some eminent Englishmen, as for instance, the great English missionary C.F. Andrews, who brought the gospel of Gandhi back to England and challenged the British government appealing to the conscience of, British public, of the British public by proclaiming the holy struggle that Gandhi is carrying on for the liberation of India. There was another man, the men of the labor movement in England, men like Attlee, men like Harold Lasky, who helped Gandhi. Together with another great European, Romain Rolland, who wrote the first book in Europe about Gandhi, this noble Englishman, Andrews, published a comprehensive book about the great soul under the name of Mahatma Gandhi's Ideas. Very soon, Gandhi became the central figure in the Indian freedom movement. And men like Motilalji Nehru, that is the father of Pandit Nehru, the present Prime Minister of India, gathered around him and the great resistance movement began. Of course, Gandhi and his disciples were again and again thrown into prison, but the movement did not stop. The campaign for Satyagraha, literally meaning in Hindustani, insistence on truth or non-violence, disobedience and non-cooperation with the government would spread to the hundreds of thousands of villages in the Indian Peninsula. And yet another weapon that Gandhi had, and these were prayer and fasting. No other mortal man has ever accomplished more for his fellow human beings as Gandhi did with his fast. When Gandhi took on himself, frail as he was, living a life of the greatest austerity, which weakened his body so much that it looked a mere bundle of bones wrapped in a dark brown skin. When Gandhi began to fuss, millions waited breathlessly and the British Empire trembled. After years of struggle, after years of darkness and disappointment and seeming hopelessness, the little half-naked fakir won the liberty for his people. The last few years of his struggle, however, were embittered by the fratricidal feelings that were raging between the Muslims and the Hindus. And he was to see with his own eyes that the hour of, Indian, of India's freedom will be darkened by the hatred and bloodshed between the two religions represented by Pakistan and Hindustan. When the British had left India and massacres and carnage spread like the Black Plague and violence was raging in every corner, Gandhi's last journey was probably the worst Golgotha that any man has traveled. He tried to stem this flood of fratricidal butchery. He threatened that he will fast unto death if these massacres will not stop. And so great was his hold on the people that wherever Gandhi arrived, people who ran amok, Muslims and Hindus, did stop and repented their blunders. But when it seemed that there was at last a chance for peace and reconciliation with the two free republics, Pakistan and Hindustan, will settle down to a peaceful cooperation, the hand of a mad, fanatical assassin put an end to the glorious life of Mahatma Gandhi. No assassination since Abraham Lincoln has shaken the world more. Gandhi was assassinated in January the 30th, 1948. That evening, Nehru, the Prime Minister, broadcasted to a broken-hearted nation, beginning with these words. Friends and comrades, the light has gone out of our lives and there is darkness everywhere and speaking extemporaneously, without script or preparation, Nero continues, the light has gone out, I said, and yet I was wrong. A thousand years later, that light will still be seen in this country and the world. For that light represented something more than the immediate present. It represented the living truth, the eternal truth. On February the 2nd, he addressed the Indian Parliament and said, that is, Nehru said, in the ages to come, centuries and maybe millenniums after us, people who think 
of this generation when this man of God trod the earth and will think of us who, however small, could also follow his path and probably tread on that holy ground where his feet had been. Let us be worthy of him. Let us always be so. In his great autobiography, called Experiments with Truth, Gandhi wrote, My life is based on disciplinary resolution. And that is true, but the resolution resulted from the experimentation. He was a reformer of the reformer. But the reform began in his heart, and he moved out by way of individuals to the million. Self-purification preceded social purification. The path of self-purification, he said, is hard and steep. To attain the perfect purity, one has to become absolutely passion-free in thought, speech, and action. To rise above the opposing currents of love and hatred, attachment and repulsion. C.F. Andrews, that great Englishman that I mentioned to you a minute ago, said, Mahatma Gandhi's estimate of human conduct will be found to center in three cardinal virtues recurrent in all his writings, and these are truth, loving kindness, and inner purity. His insatiable desire for knowledge led Gandhi to read John Ruskin's famous little book, Under This Last. He could not lay the book aside, he wrote. It gripped me. Johannesburg to Durban was a 24 hours journey, and the train reached there in the evening. But I could not get any sleep that night. I determined to change my life in accordance with the ideals of this book. And there are three. And there it is. Truth to be acted upon. The book brought about an instantaneous and practical transformation in my life. It captured me. The teaching of Anthony's last, I understood to be, one, that the good of the individual is contained in the good of all. That a lawyer's work has the same value as the barber's, inasmuch as all who have the same right of earning their livelihood from their work. That the life of labor, I the life of the tiller of the soil, and the handicraftsman is the life worth living. I arose with dawn, ready to reduce these principles to practice. Gandhi had an extraordinary effect on the people who saw him face to face. One was confronted with a saintliness, I almost said with a godliness, that made one wish to prostrate oneself before him and beg him to teach you how to lead a saintly life, how to be Mahatma-like. I shall never forget the first opportunity I had of being near to Mahatma. It was in London, in England, in 1931. Gandhi came as the chief Indian delegate to the British Round Table Conference. The English government naturally prepared for him, and the whole Indian delegation, one of the finest palaces in the capital. His popularity in England was obviously unprecedented. Gandhi had never a quarrel with the British people. On the contrary, although he attacked the British government with all his uncompromising zeal, he nevertheless, on many occasions, proclaimed his genuine love in admiration for the people of Britain and their love of justice and fair play. Tens of thousands of people naturally wanted to see the Mahatma and hear him talk, but uh, many more were probably eager to get a glimpse at this insignificant-looking darky who dared to challenge the might of the British Empire. It was Gandhi's express wish that no official honors should be bestowed upon him or receptions given for him. And he also begged to be excused that he will not be able to stay in any of the palaces offered to him. He will feel most uncomfortable there. Instead, he was prepared to live and he begged to be allowed to live there during his stay in England in the slums, in the poorest of the poor quarters, in a bare room in the east end of London, in a Quaker's settlement house for workers in both. It was impossible to see Gandhi as his every precious moment was occupied with work and conferences, and I really had not the heart to take any of his valuable time. But a friend of the Mahatma let me in to their secret, into my infinite surprise and delight. He invited me to come 
and it promised me that I should be able to talk to him if I would come to one of his early morning walks at 5 p.m. Uh, I beg your pardon, at 5 a.m. I need hardly tell you that I did not sleep that night, and I was there before the hour arrived. At exactly five o'clock, Gandhi came down the wooden stairs, wrapped in his hand-loomed loin cloth, his feet in a pair of open sandals, his legs naked, and no covering on his head. No Indian sun greeted him but a cold, miserable London foggy winter. And he looked like any Indian Oriental beggar or wandering yogi that you meet in the streets of Bombay, Calcutta, and Delhi. But when he greeted you with his hands folded and held before his mouth as if in prayer, you felt as if a divine presence came over him in his utter humility and simplicity, and you thought of the refrain of the famous hymn of Gandhi's beloved Surdas, Nirbala Kebala Rama. He is the help of the helpless, the strength of the weak. You felt that you are in the presence of one of those rare spirits that walk the earth in the guise of a frail, emaciated, unprepossessing little body. He greeted you as if you were his dearest friend and inquired about your personal life as if this were his only concern at the moment. His humility made you feel sometimes almost uncomfortable. Nevertheless, you saw that it was absolutely genuine and not the assumed modesty of the so-called great ones. But when Gandhi began his walk, supporting himself with a staff, this frail little man with his spindly legs much like a boy of 15, and I had almost to run to keep pace with him, Gandhi talking all the time about life in India, about his hopes for a settlement with the British government, about the conditions in Europe, and about the hopelessness of violent revolution. But above all, about the spiritual conditions of modern men and the role that India may play, that is, a free India, in the future, in restoring to men the spiritual values of life without which life is a mere toilsome road to perdition and oblivion. The last time I saw the Mahatma was in 1946 in India, when Pandit Nehru, the Prime Minister, invited me to come and stay at the Mahatma's street, the ashram in Pune. Of course, Nehru was not then yet the Prime Minister. He was waiting for us in the garden, taking his evening walk, leaning on the shoulders of his two young, beautiful girls, his granddaughters, Mani and Ava. He looked much older and more frail. He was after a long fast. He invited us to his bungalow, where we sat on little, on, on little cushions on the floor, and the lovely Indian hymns of the Upanishads were chanted by his disciple and by the Mahatma himself. Two books that he loved most, the Upanishads and the Bible. And I remember the melody that still lingers with me to this day of this chant from the Upanishad and the words of his own beloved hymn, Nebala Kebala Rama. He is the help of the helpless, the strength of the weak. And the words written about the most sublime bard of the English language by Ben Johnson. He was not of an age, but of all time. The world will never see his like again came to one's mind when you looked upon Mahatma Gandhi. Good afternoon.